turn in your Bibles to John chapter 20. There's a ministry called the Lumo Project, taking passages of Scripture from the Gospels, using narration from one of our English translations, to scenes from the Holy Land, actual actors from that part of the world, speaking in the ancient languages, acting out the story. So when Jesus says, peace to you, you hear him say, shalom. Meanwhile, the narrator is narrating in English. And so to read our text today, we'll see this scene from the Lumo Project. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head not lying with the linen cloths but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabunai which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. Our topic today is Jesus is alive. Can we say that? Jesus is alive. This is part of the story we heard read. We'll hear the rest of chapter 20 read in a minute. The disciples find cloths in the grave. What were these cloths? They were his grave clothes that possibly could have been hardened from the spices. I know myrrh is made from sap could have hardened and when Christ rose up he just exited his clothes I mean he with a glorified body could walk through walls why not exit his clothes for some reason he folded the cloth that was around his head they didn't know what had happened until John entered and then he realized hey this is a resurrection and he was able to line it up with scripture later on but Mary thought the body had been stolen but the question remains if the body was stolen then why undress the body wouldn't you be in a hurry especially with Romans guarding the tomb outside. And why take the time to fold the napkin? In the harsh culture of that day, if the resurrection story was a hoax, it would 
not have had any woman be an eyewitness, much less be the first eyewitness. Women were not allowed to be educated. They were kept at home. A Jewish men would say, thank God I'm not a dog or a woman. It was just cruel. And so women were not seen as reliable witnesses, and they were not allowed to testify in court. The resurrection story, if it was contrived by people wanting the world to believe something that was not true, they would not have had this part of the story. Look at this. A woman was the first to find the empty tomb. The woman was the first to tell the good news about it. At the time, she didn't know it was good news, but she was the first to tell about it. A woman was the first to hear Jesus' words. And a woman was first to obey the Lord. Go and tell others. The world has awesome communication systems. There's telecommunications. There's telephones. There's television. But the Lord used the most awesome of all. He used tell a woman. Christ came to redeem mankind from their fallen state. And part of that fallen state was this undervaluing of women that was happening in the world and even happens in our day. You know, slavery still happens. And the majority of the slaves in the world are women still going on in our day. But Christ came to bring good news of deliverance to the captives, including women. He came to elevate their position. And here this woman has a high honor. Four things right off the bat were hers to be honored with, to be part of. Verse 19. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews... Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe him. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. And put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing 
you may have life in his name. Verse 27, Jesus told Thomas, do not be unbelieving, but be believing. When the Bible uses the word translated as doubt, it literally means two ways or double vision, double ways. When we see reasons to believe and trust on one hand, and we see reasons not to believe and trust on the other hand, we hesitate. We can't make up our mind. We're stuck in doubt two ways. Do not be unbelieving, but be believing. Verse 28, Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. He realized not only was the Lord risen, but he was God. For him to not believe that, he would have been taking the Lord's name in vain. And I know there's a lot of OMG going on. But keep in mind, the Lord's name is to be valued. Somebody said, if God did Facebook, what would he write? OMS? O myself? There's a book that hit the market this week. These things always come out around Easter to try to encourage people to not be believers. And it's entitled, When Jesus Became God. And there's been a book written to respond to it called, When God Became Jesus. The point is... Jesus didn't become God when the early church organized around the 34th century to resist forces that were against them. They believed he was God right here at the resurrection. Between 20 and 30 years after this statement was recorded, after John wrote this book, in that same region of the world, there was a Roman governor named Pliny, and he wrote about Christians singing hymns to Jesus as though he were a god. He said as though he were a god because he believed in many gods. I mean, he wasn't a believer. And so historical documentation right there through Pliny's writings that he was being worshipped, Christ was being worshipped as God as early as 20 years after this statement. They worshipped him as God because they believed he was God, and their early followers taught that he was God. They knew him as God from the Scriptures and the and from Christ's own declarations. And this is why he was crucified in the first place. Verse 29, Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Are there any blessed folks in the house? We're blessed. Verse 30, truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, that is, he's the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Anybody want to have life today? It's found through calling on the name of the Lord. Top ten E reasons for believing. I know everyone here in the room may wrestle with doubt from time to time. My purpose today is to encourage you. But there may be some people here who totally do not believe in the story of the resurrection. And I wish you had a chance to respond, but we don't have that forum here today. But if you'd like to respond, I would love to talk with you one-on-one. So here goes, the top ten E reasons for believing. The first reason for believing is the testimony of the eyewitnesses. Can we say the eyewitnesses? Eyewitness testimony if determined to be reliable, is allowed to exist in the courtrooms of the world. And even in this country, it can be legally binding to the point of affecting the destiny of people who are charged either money or time from their life, and even their life if the death penalty is imposed, based on the testimony of eyewitnesses. If we take away belief in the testimony of eyewitnesses and determine them all to be unreliable, then we destroy our legal system and then the bad guys get to take over. Not that it's a perfect system, but I tell you what, we don't want the alternative. The Bible records at one point there were 500 eyewitnesses that witnessed the risen Jesus at the same time. So this is not some emotional thing that happened in some group somewhere. This impacted them for several days. Multiple people saw him. And even years later, Paul, who was on the path to destroy Christianity, saw the risen Lord and became a believer and wrote half the New Testament. Another reason for believing is the witness of the empty tomb. Can we say the empty tomb? 
The empty tomb was there as evidence. The empty grave clothes were there as evidence. The folded napkin was there as evidence. The guards who failed in their duty to keep anyone from coming in or leaving that tomb. The stone walls rolled away, not so Christ could get out, but so that they could get in and see that he was risen. The church was born 50 days after the resurrection, after his crucifixion. 50 days later, the church was born and is still alive in the earth today and still growing around the world. It was born just a short walk from the empty tomb. What a tool for evangelism. Another reason for believing is the enemies of Jesus. They became the tools of God in the testimony of these witnesses. Why were they his enemies? They hated him because he declared himself to be God. They hated him because he came against their money-making ventures that they had going on, taking advantage of people. They hated him because they believed he was violating their rules that was worthy of death. And so they not only wanted to kill him, but they wanted to kill his influence. They not only wanted to kill his influence, they wanted to prevent any fake resurrection. Because Christ had told them, kill me and in three days I'm coming back. I'm got the sign of Jonah. Three days he was in the bill of the wheel, so the Son of Man will be in, in the earth. He's coming back. And so they wanted to prevent his followers from doing that. Needless to say, the followers were too afraid to even try something like that. And they would have failed anyway because of the Roman guards. But they wanted to make sure there could be no fake resurrection. And so they kept the crime scene uncontaminated. Nobody crossed the tape. Nobody broke the seal. But the one who rose from the dead. So they give me a reason to believe. Their resistance becomes a tool. God is so awesome, even his greatest opponents wind up working for him. The Bible says that God made all things for himself, even the wicked, for the day of doom. Yep, Hitler was his firewood. Number four, another reason for believing is his empowered family. Christ had four brothers and at least two sisters, and they became believers. Now, there's plenty of cults in the world, but generally the family members of some guy that goes off starting some cult Generally, his relatives, the people he grew up with, the people that raised him, don't go along with him. There's plenty of people in the world that become famous, and sometimes their siblings, through jealousy, aren't their biggest fans. Sometimes they're kind of embarrassing. Remember Jimmy Carter? He had a brother named Billy. How much is a can of Billy beer worth today? I remember when Cassius Clay was converted to Islam and became Muhammad Ali. I recently saw a documentary on that, and they had his mother on camera denouncing this conversion. She wasn't going along with it. Christ's family didn't follow him closely till after the resurrection. And two of his brothers wrote books in the New Testament, and they died torturous deaths. James was thrown off the temple. Remember the temple where Satan tempted Jesus to jump off? They took him there and threw his brother James off. And there he is laying down, his body broken. They're going to stone him completely to death. And he's still testifying to the reality of the deity of his brother and the reality of the resurrection, not recanting his death. A prophet is honored everywhere except at their hometown. Christ is honored by his family. Another reason for believing is his energized followers. Before the resurrection, they were hiding. They were afraid. They had abandoned Jesus. Peter abandoned him to the point of cussing and saying, I never knew the guy. The resurrection and the infilling of the Spirit empowered them to become radical evangelists. Doubting Thomas took the gospel farther than any of the other of the group. He took the gospel to India and established seven local churches that are there to this day. We used to have members of the church till they moved. An Indian family came to church here till they moved to Houston. I do not remember their last name, but Daniel was a husband. Daniel's wife was a descendant of the converts of Thomas. And he too died a painful death. They all were tortured. Only John died a natural death. The rest were tortured and killed, and none of them recanted their faith 
in the resurrection story. Now, I know people often can die for their faith, but under torture, somebody's going to crack. Those who died for Jim Jones died because they believed in him, but they drank Kool-Aid. Their death was rather painless. Peter was crucified upside down and didn't recant his faith in Jesus. There's something to the resurrection story. The theories you hear were after the fact. The theories wouldn't have stood during that day. Oh, he just fainted. These people knew what crucifixion was like. There's no fainting. There's dying. Another reason for believing was the spreading of the gospel, evangelism spreading around the world, establishing churches made up of people who believed in the resurrection. And it's still continuing to this day. I read a report this week from Peru. Peru is going through amazing changes that really increased in the last decade. And it has to do with the increasing of the gospel after, not before, after the prospering of the people. As the nation began to prosper, the gospel began to spread. Sometimes you see the reverse. But in this case, as the people began to be blessed by God's unmerited favor, they began to turn to Christ left and right. Check it out. Peru is turning around. The enraged Roman Empire. Not only were the religious leaders of the Judaism of the day against Christ, and they were his enemies, but the empire eventually came on board because Christians were radical and people that were converted to Christianity refused to worship the Caesar and the Roman system of government. Even though there were peace-loving people, they began to slaughter Christians by the tens of thousands and torturing them and throwing them to the lions and, and having them torn apart in front of the masses of cheering crowds in their coliseums. Then there came the day of the embracing of the Roman Empire. We may question his motives, but Constantine began to turn things around for the suffering church. And the Roman Empire began to spread the story of the resurrection. And the big reason for believing the resurrection is the enduring results even in our day. You're in a room filled with people who believe in this story. And as they became believers in Jesus and his death and resurrection, their lives began to change. Not only were they freed from guilt, but he began to give power over addictions. Lives began to change through believing in the resurrection. It's happening in our day could happen to you today. You could begin to experience the results of that. And finally, since Christ rose from the dead, Easter has never been the same. What's the eggs and the bunny? Those are the remains of a pagan holiday. Christ arose on a pagan holiday. Every day belongs to the Lord. So poor Ishtar, her holiday got hijacked by the resurrection. never been the same. Here's my big point. You're familiar with B.C. and A.D. Before Christ is B.C. A.D. is not after death. It's Anno Domine, which means the year of the Lord. Anno is related to the word annual or, t- or year or time. Domine is related to the word dominate or Lord. From the time of our Lord, time is measured forward. So the appropriate way to say 2014 is A.D., 2014. A.D. comes first. I know often it's done the reverse. What happened was there was a lot of conflict in the church as to when Christ actually resurrected. When was the day that he arose from the dead? Even to this day, the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church celebrate different days. In 525 A.D., Pope John I appointed a man named Dionysius, a Scythian monk, to do research and to help resolve this matter. As a result of his work, this began to be about. So when you trace the history of historians beginning to use B.C. and A.D., you trace it back. It all goes back to Dionysius and the work that he did. Now, the Jews have had a calendar for thousands of years that goes back to their recordings related to the life of 
Adam. The first Adam. But the world's calendar is related to the life, think about this, of the last Adam. He declared himself to be the first and the last. Now before this began to be used, history was always connected time-wise to who was in power at the time. Even in the Bible. In the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up. You'll see this thing throughout history. During the reign of Charlemagne, this happened. In my own life, I was born during the early days of the reign of Queen Elizabeth, during an election year, when Eisenhower won his second election. It was a whole lot easier to say I was born A.D. 1956. We no longer really use time based on the lives of kings because the king of kings and the Lord of lords arose from the dead. Amen? He's the last king of all the kings before him. And he's their king. And he's the first king of all the kings after him. And he's their king. Is this making any sense? I mean, that's it. The whole world is impacted. History is marked by the resurrection. Now, those that want to give honor to other religions will exercise something that's been going on since the 17th century, BCE and CE. BCE means before common era or before current era, or even it can also mean before Christian era. And CE means Christian era, or common era, or current era. So however you define BCE or CE, you're still not getting away from the resurrection. It's in your face! Christ told Thomas, Do not be unbelievable. Lord, I pray for every person here as we consider the claims of the resurrection. I pray, Lord, people would not just be amused by a historical debate or be swayed by human logic, but, Lord, I pray that your spirit would bring conviction, that it would not just be mental assent to a historical event, but, Lord, it would be a heart-changing revelation. I want to just conclude with three points. There is no one who's not been separated from God and His gift of eternal life that He has for us. We are all born separated from that. We are born in sin. You don't think it. Look at the world full of problems. And yes, there have been times that Christianity was hijacked by bad people. But that doesn't do away with the real thing. We don't quit using currency. I'm not going to use cash anymore because there's some counterfeits. Well, good luck with that. Find somebody to trade your rocks with you. Well, I want just gold. Well, good luck with that. Better get a big safe. There's no way to remedy this separation problem, and it is a problem, without our believing that Jesus Christ died for us. By believing that, we're recognizing that we're worthy of death. We're sinners. That we're already dead because of sin. Just like cutting a rose off from the rose bush is already dead, even though it doesn't appear to be, it will appear as time goes on that it was cut off from its life source 
And so death in us appears as time goes on. But Christ died for us so that we could have a new start. There's no better time for us than now today to begin believing in Him and His resurrection. He not only died for us, He arose from the dead for us. For you. It's a simple gospel. Jesus is alive. Are you alive? He came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. It can, it can start out as simple as praying, Lord, I've heard what is called the good news. Christians call it the gospel. And I'm finding myself believing this. So I ask you to be my Savior. Forgive me. Come into my life and make me yours. It's that simple. He is gentle. He is here by His Spirit. He's drawn us to Himself. If you find yourself believing what I've proclaimed, that is saving faith dawning in your heart, receive that faith and call on His name. Can we do it right now? Let's say, Jesus... I believe you died for me and that you've risen from the dead. Forgive me of my sins. Make me yours. Lord, roll the stone away in every heart. Open our eyes to you. Today, April 20th, A.D. 2014. I got every reason to be here again. The Father's love. Draws me in. How my eyes want to see is a glimpse of you. And all I need is.